This one's gonna go over well. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today I'm talking about a game that is considered one of the best JRPGs of all time. I recently played the first game in the series and greatly enjoyed it, but today I'm talking about Suikoden 2. And that's a different story. Suikoden 2 was developed by Konami and released for the PlayStation in 1998 in Japan and over the following two years in North America and Europe. The game's opening is strong. Protagonist Ryu and his friend Joey are members of the Youth Brigade in the Highland Kingdom's army. Things soon go sideways when Luca Blight, the Prince of Highland, orchestrates a slaughter of their unit in order to frame the neighboring city-state of Jouston and start a war. As the only surviving witnesses to this, Ryu and Joey find themselves running for their lives. Ryu runs right into some familiar faces from Suikoden 1, who I thought had died. I was happy to see them as they were two of my favorites, but this also retroactively lessened the emotional impact of the end of the first game. Their appearance also grinds the exciting opening to a halt as they assign the player a whole bunch of chores to do back at their base. Ryu and Joey escape to find Ryu's sister, Nanami, and eventually all of them are declared traitors to Highland. Of course, it also turns out that Ryu and Joey are special and are bestowed two halves of the Rune of Beginning, Ryu getting the Bright Shield Rune and Joey getting the Black Sword Rune. Ryu eventually becomes leader of the new Joustin army, attempting to stop Highland's path of death and destruction. Much of the rest of the game is about trying to get other cities to ally with you, fighting Highland, and of course, recruiting the 108 Stars of Destiny and building up your castle. So many people have told me that Suikoden 2 is just like 1, but better. Some have even said that you could skip 1 and go right to 2. But I have to say that though there are definitely some quality of life improvements, I found this game to be just like 1, but worse. When it comes to game length and content, bigger is not always better. While the first game wrapped up in about 20 hours, this one took me almost twice as long. They took the formula from the first game and just jammed it with extra stuff. There's a trading minigame where you need to buy low and sell high in different towns. When you get to your castle, there are all kinds of random things to collect for it. Seeds for vegetables, farm animals, recipes, hammers, deity plans, books. You can fish, play dice games, or whack-a-mole. It's a lot, it's all time-consuming, and most of it isn't all that interesting. And then, of course, there's recruiting the Stars of Destiny. Unlike in the first game, where the recruitable characters were the only ones with unique designs, so it was easy to spot them, here, all the characters in towns look different, so you really need to talk to everyone if you don't want to miss people. And some of the requirements for recruitment are just dumb. To recruit Stallion, you need to run from battles 50 times, a giant time sink. To recruit a pack of flying squirrel characters, you need to walk a certain path on the world map until you encounter them. The guides I looked at actually suggest just standing still for 30 minutes for the best chance of this happening. This is the kind of nonsense that turned me off JRPGs. The pace of the game just seemed off. While you can start recruiting early, I didn't get my castle until about 8 hours in, much later than I expected considering how building it up is such a big part of the game. Though the game is, at times, quite open and full of things to explore and discover, I often felt railroaded during missions. Some missions, like going after Necklord or the search for dragon eggs, are great, with a good balance of dialogue, combat, village exploration, and throwbacks to the first game. Others lock you into cutscene after cutscene and scripted tactical battles that go on for far too long. Even some missions where you have more control over things, like retrieving your stolen wallet or looking for Teresa in Greenhill, got very tedious. Just like in Suikoden 1, there are three different kinds of combat to engage in. Regular battles, duels, and massive battles. 
Regular battles are very similar. You control six characters, a party size I really like, and fight enemies distributed into rows. You give commands to all of your characters and they can attack, defend, use a rune, an item, unite with another character for a combo attack, or shift their place in the formation. After all commands are given, both your party and the enemies will carry out their attacks in an order based on their speed. There are a few improvements over the first game for regular battles. For one, there are more runes usable in combat. Each character can equip up to three runes, and each has a number of different spells to choose from, which increases as you level. Also, the UI actually tells you what the various runes do this time around, which was a huge oversight in the first game. Now you can see how much damage a rune will do, if it will hit a single target, everything, or only a certain row or column. I also found that there were many more opportunities to use unite attacks in this game, as the protagonist had a number of different characters they could unite with. When combat is first encountered, you can also choose to run away, try to bribe the enemy into leaving you alone, or set everyone to auto-attack, so you don't need to spend time individually commanding everyone. This can be a time-saver for easier battles. Overall, it's a rather basic combat system, not the most exciting. However, everything looks good, from the effects of the runes, to the enemy designs, and the character animations and close-ups when you get a critical hit. Fights are also more challenging than they were in the first game, which was a little on the easy side. Duels are also very similar to the first game. There are three options, attack, wild attack, or defend, and each one has a strength or weakness, like rock, paper, scissors. You need to guess what your opponent will do based on what they say to you, and choose the action you think will counter it. The biggest change is to the massive battles. Rather than another type of rock, paper, scissors where you need to pick a unit type that best opposes the enemy's unit, here, the battles are grid-based and tactical. While this sounds much more interesting in theory, it really isn't. The first handful of turns of most battles consists of moving your units, one square at a time, until they're in range to do anything. When you finally get in range, very few units can do anything but a basic attack. These battles are very slow and uneventful. To make matters worse, the end of most of them are scripted, you hold out for a certain number of turns, and then someone retreats, making the whole thing seem rather pointless. Though very simple, I much preferred the first game's massive battles. They were quick and more entertaining to watch play out. Now, I don't want to make it sound like this is all bad. There are a lot of great things in this game, many of which are quality of life type improvements, but there are also some really cool additions. First, there are dogs everywhere, and you can talk to all of them. Plus one to the review score for that. In your castle, you can recruit a chef, who runs a restaurant. In addition to choosing the menu, there are cooking competitions where other chefs will appear to challenge him. I love a cooking contest in a game, and while this doesn't quite live up to the Iron Chef competition in Star Ocean Second Story, it's still a lot of fun. You pick the ingredients, then the chefs will make an appetizer, meal, and dessert, and then be judged. The judges are a random selection of your recruits, and their introductions help you get to know them a little better. One of the best recruits in this game is Richmond, a private investigator. Not only does he have one of my favorite ultra-jazzy musical themes in the game, but he can also help you out with recruiting and getting to know companions. You can get help in finding out what you need to do to recruit those you haven't yet, or have Richmond find out the secrets of characters who have already joined you. Ethical? Definitely not. But fun. There are also some really excellent battles and boss fights. When you finally face off against Luca Blight, you need to split into three parties, each of which needs to battle him. This added a little strategy and challenge to things, and really made the fight feel like the stakes were higher than ever. Improvements were made in inventory and equipment management as well. This game has a party inventory, which was a huge relief. It makes managing items and equipment much easier. Characters have a small inventory as well, along with the standard equipment slots. 
Accessories, which can boost stats, take up the same slots as usable items and potions, so you need to decide which is more important. It still does take a long time to get party members battle ready though, as items, runes, weapon sharpening, and armor are all spread among different vendors in different towns, or throughout your castle. I'd say the inventory system in this game is a definite improvement, but could still use a little work. One area of the game I have no complaints about is how it looks and sounds. The pixel art is crisp and detailed, and the colors of the clothing on each character really pop. Animations look great during battle, and I love that Ryu has an idle animation when you leave him standing still on the world map. While there are some generic looking cave type dungeons to traverse, the cities, castles, and buildings are all beautifully designed. Enemies are also really well done. From giant monsters you'll fight as boss battles, to the ones you'll see multiple times in random battles, they all look really good. Some of the enemies are so whimsical and charming, like killer bunnies or land sharks. I really love the Do Re Mi elves who sing at you to attack. An epic score accompanies the game. I particularly like the exciting and dramatic battle theme. The killer combination of organ and electric guitar in Gothic Necklord, and the track Reminiscence, which is a beautiful piano piece. I listened to the soundtrack as I wrote this script, and it is gorgeous, as a standalone or accompanying the gameplay. Unfortunately, in this North American version of the game at least, the massive battles aren't accompanied by music. This no doubt contributes to how dull they feel. There was an error in mastering the disc, so some tracks just don't play. I also ran into missing music while recruiting a character called Annalie. You ask her to sing a song for you, but no music comes out. She just stands there with her mouth hanging open in silence for 60 seconds. It's kinda creepy. And that's not all for bugs. I also experienced a number of issues in Tinto. First, when leaving a building, I seemed to step out into a void that I was unable to return from. And while running through the town, I got stuck and was unable to move a few times. I'm not used to encountering bugs like this in PS1 games. In terms of the overall story, I thought it was inferior to the original game. There are parts of it that really work for me, but much of it doesn't. There will be some major spoilers talked about here, I will have that section clearly marked in the video's chapters. Luca Blight, the initial antagonist of this story, is a bad villain. Not bad as in very evil, bad as in ridiculous and unbelievable. He goes through the world, burning entire towns, laughing maniacally, and calling everyone pigs and commanding them to crawl before him. It's not intimidating, it's silly. I found myself rolling my eyes every time he was on screen. He's also not really given any motivation. At one point it's mentioned that his father, the king, had failed him and his mother in some way, but that's it. There are more details about that in Suikoden lore, but they are not mentioned in this game. Having one big bad who I didn't find effective at all seemed like such a step back from the first game's more grounded story of revolution and civil unrest. However, as the game went on, and Ryu visited different cities, the world did get more interesting. It wasn't just one evil man they were fighting, it was also failures of leadership among supposed allies. Ryu was trying to build a united front to face a common enemy, but most of the other leaders were too proud, selfish, or weak to step up to the task. This is where the story was most interesting, seeing characters with believable flaws unable to put their differences aside and work together, even when it was in their best interest. But then the story takes a nosedive again. Joey, who had done a heel turn at the beginning of the game, becomes the main antagonist once you defeat Luca Blight. I'd assumed that his betrayal early on was more than what it looked like, that there was some secret plan that would eventually lead to peace in a roundabout way. 
But no, Luca dies and Joey takes his place, continuing on the warpath. His motivations made no sense at all to me, and the explanation for why Joey and Ryu continue to fight seems to be… because destiny? As the bearers of two opposing runes, the former best friends are destined to oppose each other. This is lazy, lazy writing. Suikoden 2 never gave me a good emotional gut punch like 1 did. There were some characters I really liked. Nanami is awesome. She's fiercely loyal to her brother, strong but naive, and also very silly at times, and I found the game's most amusing scenes involved her. I also loved seeing Victor and Flick again. Mostly, I found I got to know and appreciate the characters I had already met in the first game, building on what I already knew about them. With few exceptions, it didn't really feel like I got to know or appreciate the brand new characters. There's just so many of them. A few scenes in the game are meant to be emotionally affecting, but they just don't quite land. One which could have been great was when refugees are fleeing the Highland army. Your supposed allies are supposed to protect them, but they don't. The refugees are slaughtered while you look on helplessly. But this is all set against the massive battle tactic screen, which unfortunately completely lacks music to really drive home any emotion. But the most egregious, would-be heartbreaking scene happens to my girl Nanami. Late in the game, the two of you encounter Joey and talk about fate being the reason for fighting, and then are ambushed with a volley of arrows. Nanami is up front, and then… a quick time event happens? Seriously? After 30 plus hours of slow moving dialogue, turn based combat, and never having to react quickly to anything, a dialogue prompt appears for less than one second, where you can warn her to look out. Nanami fails to deflect the last arrow and is seemingly mortally wounded. Though she was my favorite character, I couldn't feel sad about her potential death. I was too busy being frustrated with how it played out. After this, there's a string of overly long war battles, but then a rather exciting final dungeon with some really excellent combat in it. The final final big bad ends up being another rune, which is… whatever, but it is a fun and great looking fight. So, sweep it in two. Honestly, it was kind of a disappointment after how much I enjoyed the first game, especially hearing so many people say that it was not only an improvement, but also one of the best JRPGs of all time. I think this is a game I would have enjoyed more if I had played it closer to its original release. I had much more tolerance for JRPG nonsense at 16 than I do now. It's still a really great looking and sounding game, with some really cool boss fights and a number of lovable characters. But the overall story just didn't work for me. The game felt bloated and the tactical battles were a real drag. If you haven't played this series before, don't let anyone tell you that you should skip right to this game. The most enjoyable moments for me came from characters and events that were directly from the first game, and that would have been lost if I hadn't played it. Also, if you play 1 and import your save into 2, there are some extra little bonuses you can find, which I just had to say to prevent 7,000 people from telling me in the comments. If you want to see another shorter JRPG I enjoyed, check out my video on Rhapsody A Musical Adventure. Or my review of the first Suikoden. I have a Patreon if you want to support the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.